is up welcome back to the channel today we got another install for you we will finally be installing a boost gauge into the turbo miata a boost gauge isn't always necessary but it is nice to have you'll be able to monitor whether or not your boost is climbing and it shouldn't be or if you have boost leak you're not seeing the boost numbers you want to see a boost controller controls the amount of boost that your turbo is allowing into the engine Right now, I'm just running on an eight pound wastegate spring, so the minimum amount of boost that my car sees is eight pounds. It does, however, creep up to about 10 in third or fourth gear when I'm full throttle on the street. Now, this is the boost gauge that I have. I do not know what brand it is or what model or anything. It was a cheaper version that you can find on Amazon. You don't have to go super crazy with your gauges as long as you can get some sort of accurate reading from the turbo as a reference. A manual boost controller is just controlled with a knob on the top. You turn it for more or less boost. Pretty simple, pretty easy. As long as you have a boost gauge to be able to monitor what your boost levels are at, a manual boost controller works just fine. Installing a boost gauge does require a little bit of basic wiring abilities. Not very difficult to do, you just need a power and a ground. Although the 12 volt power does need to be ignition on and off or some way that it will power off with the key. And along with being a key on and off, you do want it to be ran through a fuse or a relay. You don't want that to just have straight power to it. It'll just stay on and it'll kill your battery. A 52 millimeter gauge can actually pop into your air vents in a Miata. We're going to utilize the second vent right in the center console to go right along with the air fuel ratio gauge. It'll kind of round out what we got going on here. And while you're drifting, this one kind of just flops around. It doesn't do anything anyways. These are pretty easy to pop in and out. Just grab a pliers here and just give it a pull and the whole cup comes right out. The next thing I'm gonna do is just pop out the center or the actual movable part of the vent because we don't need the center, we just need the cup on the outside. So what we'll need to be able to remove the center portion of this vent is just a small pointy screwdriver. There's small little tabs in here, which this is very old, like old, old plastic. So there is a very good chance that this could break. We're just gonna kinda be nice and careful and it should pop open fairly easy. Just like that. Now we just gotta pop out that section. The rest of it can go right back together. Just like that. Now we just have to press in the boost gauge into the cup. It is very snug fit. So just be careful when you're pressing it in that you don't break the gauge but we want to slide it all the way in so it's all the way tight. Just like that. All right, the next thing we're going to tackle is putting a vacuum line on the back side of this gauge. Real simple quarter inch vacuum line, not real expensive. This came with the line for it. So it goes over this little port pretty easy and it does come with little clamps as well. So we're going to slide that clamp on so it doesn't come off while we're on or off the track. We want to have a good, accurate reading we don't want this to leak at all, so a clamp has to be on this. And just like that, we got it on there. Just a little pinch clamp, nothing crazy. The next thing we gotta do is figure out what we're gonna do for wiring. Grounding a gauge is very easy. You just take your black wire and you run it to any chassis bolt that you can find, basically. Just make sure you're actually touching bare metal and not paint. The power, however, does need to go to an ignition key on, key off power source. I'm going to use the power that goes to the cigarette lighter. I don't smoke, I don't have the cigarette lighter in the car anymore, and I already have the AFR gauge running to that power source as well. Then both the gauges run off the same fuse. It's a 10 amp fuse, nothing crazy, and then I already know where it is. Before I get too far into trying to do any of the wiring or installing the vacuum line through the dash, I do need to modify the vent tube that comes up from the blower motor. I need to either put a hole into that tube or I need to fully remove that from behind the dash. So I'm gonna take a look at that real quick and show you guys what we're working with. Might be a little difficult for you to see, but this is that tube that comes up from the blower motor so the heat can come out into the uh, interior of the car. There's a slight gap right here. There is that little bit of a gap, but that gauge is too deep for that. It goes too far into the dash. So we need to either remove that or I need to pop a hole in the bottom of that tube so we can run the wires and the line down to the bottom. If we look behind the AFR gauge, all I did was pop a hole in the bottom of that tube. 
It's not like it's real thick material or anything. It actually put a hole in that pretty easy. So I might just do the same thing over there. I don't need any heat coming from the center. There's vents on the side. I mainly just need the defrost on the windshield. The rest of the air doesn't really matter inside the car. After further investigation behind the dash, I would have to pull off like half the dash to be able to get those tubes disconnected from the backside. So all we're gonna do instead is just pop a hole in the bottom, big enough for the vacuum line and two wires to go through. And that should be plenty good for what we're doing with this gauge. Now that we have a hole in that vent tube, now we can start to put some wiring to this gauge. I do not have red power wire to be able to run the power to an ignition switch. I do, however, have black wire and a marker. So all I'm going to do, I put yellow dots on this black wire for power. So for future me, just remember, this is your power wire. Now it's not a big deal for me because this is my vehicle, but if you have to do something like this to your own vehicle, make sure you do something you can remember or tell apart from the rest of your wiring or make note of it somewhere. I might put a piece of tape on this that says power as well, just so I don't forget. So in the future, if I ever have to diagnose a power problem with this gauge, I know what I'm looking for. If you do not have one of these tools, this is a wire stripping tool. It's very handy and very important to have one of these for doing any type of wiring on your vehicle. So I already have the wires prepped that plug into the back of the gauge. Now I just need to prep the power and ground that I'm gonna to splice to that. This is only about maybe 20 inches. I need a lot longer of a, a distance than this for this gauge. So what I did is I took about two more additional feet. This is the power with those yellow dots like I was saying before. Now I just have to splice this to that. I have butt connectors that I'm going to use. You just clip on this and slide it off to expose the wire. So for splicing the wire, I have these little connectors. You just slide the wire into the end, crimp it down with the pliers, and then you can add heat to these and it shrinks around your wire so there's nothing exposed. You don't want, especially a power wire, to be exposed and rub on anything to where it can short out the gauge or pop fuses. So all we're doing here, sliding this right into the end, just make sure it goes all the way in there and taking the pinch piece of this pliers and squishing it down so that it can't come off. We'll do that with the other couple of pieces of wire and then we will go ahead and install it into the vehicle. I got the wires ran through and the vacuum line ran through. So it comes down behind the dash back here where the radio used to be. The power goes off towards the driver's side and then the ground wire and the vacuum line I have routed going off to the passenger side. Now I just have to slide this down in a little farther, the right direction. I don't wanna put it in upside down. And then we can just pop it right into place. Make sure it's nice and straight too. I don't want that crooked. There we go. The gauge is pressed in. It'll be AFR gauge and then the boost gauge over here. The next step will be wiring the power wire in and the ground wire and getting the vacuum line hooked up to the manifold on the passenger side. We are going to work on what's in here first, then we will finish up in the engine bay. So it'll be a little tricky to see, but you can tell I got the power wire ran through here, and then I'm wiring it to the back side of the cigarette lighter that is key on and off with the ignition. I can access the wires behind it to be able to splice the new power wire in with the AFR gauge power wire. So it'll be kind of hard to tell which wires are what. That's the main harness coming through here up to the ignition and the dash up there. But then these wires right here are for the boost gauge and the AFR gauge. So everything is kind of tied together on this center little piece that supports the dash. Now we get to go behind the glove box back here where I will grab the negative or the ground and the vacuum line. I have to run it up somewhere above so people can't kick this. And then there's a grommet up on the firewall from where the AC box used to sit in here. The hard line went through the firewall with a little rubber grommet on it. Make sure when you run any type of vacuum line, make sure there's a grommet that you can run it through so that this rubber line is not rubbing on bare steel or bare metal. That is not good if you lose your boost reference or any type of vacuum line like that. 
Now it is very tight up inside there, so I'm going to install that into the firewall and then I will show you guys once I'm pulling it back through the front side of the firewall so we can get that wired in up front and run that vacuum line. I have the vacuum line and the ground wire ran through the firewall. So where we're gonna mount this, we're gonna mount the vacuum line right on this port on the back of the intake manifold. It used to be ran off of like the EGR system, your exhaust gas recirculation. I do not have that installed anymore. I mean, it's clearly here, but it doesn't actually go around to the exhaust anymore because there's a turbo there. So this vacuum line is gonna utilize this port right here. I did just have it capped, so I pulled that off. We can just slide that on, put a little pinch clamp on it, and that vacuum line is good to go. When you're putting in a boost gauge, that vacuum line needs to have positive and negative pressure. What does that actually mean? So, your throttle body controls that pressure. When the butterfly on the throttle is open, that shows positive pressure inside the manifold. That means there is turbo pressure there or whatever force induction, and that sends that signal to your boost gauge to go up in number. When the butterfly closes, that creates a negative space behind the throttle body, which is a vacuum. Because the engine is still running, it's still pushing exhaust out, it has to pull somewhere, and it creates that negative space in the throttle body. So let's get this vacuum line put on here with this little pinch clamp. You might need a pliers because that digs into your fingers and it's a very strong clamp. Make sure we get this routed how we want it, which basically is, and make sure that the pinch clamp is accessible when you have it on there. Get that slid all the way on. Just make sure we got plenty of line on that little port. It's nice and snug on there, it's fresh line. And then put the pinch clamp right over it. Now we will move on to the ground. We are just going to utilize the ground point that was used for the EGR. That's where we have the AFR router to currently. Very easy spot to be able to just squish that little piece right in underneath that nut. I already put that little connector piece on there. Let's get that run underneath some stuff. Let's slip it in right next to the other one without pushing the other one out. So we want both of those clamped on there nice and tight. Just like that. Now I'm gonna grab a zip tie for this as well and kind of just zip tied the little bit of extra up and out of the way as well so it's not flopping there and we don't want that to get yanked or pulled out. I believe we got this all installed, the wiring is all done, the ground, the power, and we have the vacuum line ran through the firewall. So now we're just gonna give it a quick test. We're just gonna key on the ignition. It should power up the gauge. If it doesn't, we'll diagnose what the problem is and try something else out. In theory, it should work just fine. Then we'll go ahead and start it, let the car warm up a little bit. I am not gonna drive it on the street to test the gauge. It snowed fairly recent, so there is salt and snowy roads right now. I don't wanna take the drift car out. It's got a welded diff. That probably wouldn't do so great in the snow. I got the key in the ignition. We'll give it a turn. I am very excited to see what it illuminates as. I don't know what color it's gonna be. I bought this thing like two years ago, so I don't remember what it's supposed to actually look like. We will test it out. So, key on. All right, so it's not as illuminated as I thought. It's basically just the needle, unless you can press the button and it changes something. It just seems like the button is stuck. So give me a quick second. I'm gonna figure out why that's not working. All right, so I think I got something figured out. It does seem like this, the button is stuck right now, and I think it's because the gauge is so tight in this cup, it's squishing the side of the, the actual gauge itself. So it's just cycling through the different colors you can choose, which I mean, isn't the end of the world if it just cycles through color. The good thing though, it does cycle on and off, with the key. So that's the main thing that it's able to turn on and off with the key. So I've cycled the key on and off maybe three, four times. Every time I turn it off and then back on, it changes the color on the gauge. Probably not supposed to do that, but hey, it's a very cheap Amazon purchase. 
I'm not gonna complain. If it cycles on and off and you have a different color every time, oh well. With a little further investigation into the gauge, the button is in fact stuck. That being said, just every time that I key off and then back on, it's gonna change color, no big deal. Now we're gonna start the car up, let it warm up, and see what the gauge actually reads when there is positive and negative pressure in the intake manifold. So because I don't have the throttle open and it's not actually creating boost, it is a negative pressure right now. At higher RPM or when you get into boost though, the needle will climb above zero and show the actual PSI of the turbo. I'm super excited to be able to actually get this out on the road after the snow melts away and there's not salt on the road. Then I can actually see some boost numbers coming out of that gauge. Now that the boost gauge is all complete, that's in the car, it is working and functioning almost how it should be, minus the button sticking a little bit and just changing colors on its own or key on and off. That's not that big of a deal. The gauge still works. It's giving me a reading when I'm in the car driving, so I don't have to have my laptop hooked up all the time. Well, it is now a week later after installing the boost gauge into the vehicle. The snow is all melted and gone. The roads are all clear. It's been a nice, beautiful 50 degrees all week, so we don't have to worry about salt or anything nasty on the ground. So we'll take the Miata out for a cruise and make sure that the gauge is working and functioning and showing some sort of boost levels. Right now it should only read up to eight or maybe 10 pounds if it boost creeps a little bit. So that we at least have an idea of where it should be. We'll see if it's actually accurate compared to what my laptop shows. So we will get this thing warmed up and we'll take it out for a cruise. All right, so I went ran into town real quick, got some fresh fuel after sitting for like six months. We got fresh 92 in it. We'll get back out into some country roads and give you a couple of pulls so you guys can see the new boost gauge in action. So far so good, the boost gauge is working. It is reading about 10 pounds or 10 PSI on the gauge from where I'm sitting. The driver's seat looking at the gauge is a little bit at an angle. Maybe you guys saw a little bit better angle than I did. Hopefully I'd be able to zoom that in for you and was, you were able to see it. So now what we're gonna do, I have this manual boost controller. I'm gonna get this installed into the vehicle. It is pretty simple to do. Basically all I need to do is splice this vacuum line that comes right off the actual like compressor side of the turbo and goes to the wastegate. So this vacuum line just gives the wastegate boost pressure. As soon as it sees eight pounds, the spring inside allows that diaphragm to open, which then presses this lever and opens the wastegate inside of the turbine housing. Now a manual boost controller is pretty simple to install. You just basically have to cut that vacuum line in half and slide this thing in place. So you, there's a little arrow which direction it's gotta go. And then this knob on top is for more or less boost with a needle dial inside of it. So it's basically a set screw with a little tip that plugs a hole down there. When you have it all the way down on the minimum setting or the least amount of boost, it is just wide open like what it's already in the car. Just a vacuum line giving the wastegate boost pressure. When you start to turn that dial to go more boost. It then opens that little needle in that valve and lets some of that boost pressure escape instead of going to the wastegate. So it's basically just creating a vacuum leak that gives your turbo more boost into the engine. Now that being said, you do have to be pretty careful with a manual boost controller just in case it were to fail. It is operated with a little ball valve inside and a spring. You gotta make sure every once in a while that you take a look at that and make sure nothing's going wrong or hopefully that nothing sticks and you don't moon boost your car and throw rods or anything like that. We don't want that to happen with this car. We want this to be budget friendly and reliable. Now this manual boost controller did come with this little mounting bracket with a couple of little Allen key bolts and very, very small lock washers. So that screws into the backside of this 
boost controller, either like this or like this or however you decide to put that on. And then you can bolt this into your engine bay somewhere. I'm not entirely sure where I actually want to mount this. I might end up doing something where it's like right in here, somewhere on the side, like where the fender well is over here. I don't want to mount it on the engine to where it can get hot or have the vacuum lines next to a heat source. I want this to stay over on this cooler side or cooler area. So I'm not, I'm not gonna self tap it into anything either. I have a couple of little bolt holes where I can maybe drill something out and get it a 10 millimeter in here. There's like a welded nut on the backside right there. I'm kind of leaning towards putting it right there. So I'll maybe see if I can do that. Otherwise I'll have to find another spot up here where I can get this mounted. And there you have it. Boost line goes in and then comes back out to the wastegate. I have it on the lowest setting right now. So it should just be eight pound gate pressure right now, just like I've normally been running it. It's already been running just eight pounds or on the new gauge it's saying 10. We're gonna go test it real quick, do like one or two quick little pulls, second gear, just to see what the boost gauge shows with the boost controller all the way down. And then we'll work up one click at a time and watch the boost gauge and the air fuel ratio gauge at the same time because they're side by side. The more boost you add into the car means the more air goes into the car, which in turn, you then need more fuel to mix with the air in the combustion chamber. We'll pay attention to that and make sure everything is safe and add just a little bit of boost and see what it looks like. I'd give that a win. The boost gauge is in, it's installed, working somewhat properly. Yes, the color does change, but at least it gives us a number. The boost controller is also installed. Zero clicks is basically wastegate spring or wastegate pressure, which is eight pounds. Two clicks is 10 PSI. Four or five clicks is around 12 to 13 PSI. That's perfect. I even wrote myself some notes right on the inside of the fender here, right next to the boost controller so that I remember for in the future. So that's gonna do it for this episode. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe.